Hi everybody, uh, wonderful to see so many familiar faces and names and some new ones too. Uh, welcome to this month's Office Hours. I'm Zoe from the Rebus community. Uh, really excited to chat today with our guests and all of you about print and OER. Uh, this has been a really popular topic we've seen from the RSVPs. With that in mind, I'll just note that if you're uh, not speaking, I might ask you to turn your video off just so we make sure that everything stays stable uh, as we go. Um, but certainly turn it on if you want to chime in at any point um, and ask questions when we get to that portion. Um, as always, we are thrilled to be hosting this session with our partners at OTN. Uh, and so we'll hand over to Karen in a moment to introduce our guests. And I wanted to start with a little moment of I, being a professional book nerd, uh, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. Um, I've kind of been, been blown away myself when you actually see an OER in print, what a kind of impact it can have. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of work that goes into getting to that point, which is what we're going to be chatting about today. Uh, so I hope it's a a really interesting and, and useful session for you all and look forward to hearing from everybody. So thank you, Karen. All right. Thanks, Zoe. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Lorison with the Open Textbook Network, and we're excited to be here co-hosting uh, office hours with the Rebus community. So um, as you or many of you probably know, uh, in these sessions, we talk informally about issues in open textbook publishing. And these, these conversations are really community driven. So there was a comment in the chat that um, these topics are always really great and we usually get our ideas from you. So uh, please let us know what you'd like to talk about in future office hour sessions. So as Zoe mentioned today, we're gonna to talk about uh, making OER available in print. And why is it so hard? That's the secret subtitle. Um, it's not as easy as it seems like it should be. Um, so today we're going to talk about how to research print on demand suppliers, on campus printing options, ISBNs, dealing with bookstores, creating print covers and all sorts of good stuff. So I too am excited to learn a lot more and um, we'll hear from each of our guests for about three to five minutes and then turn things over to you for your questions and comments. So Unfortunately, we just heard one of our guests, Brian Mosher, is feeling unwell today, so he will not be able to join us as expected, but we have three fabulous guests um, who will uh, talk, and I'll hand things over to them shortly after I tell you who they are. Uh, we're going to first hear from Amanda Wentworth. She is OER Publishing Coordinator at SUNY, and next we'll hear from Elizabeth Mays. She is the Director of Sales and Marketing at Pressbooks. And then finally, we'll hear from Jonathan Lashley, who is Senior Instructional Technologist at Boise State University. So now I'm gonna turn things over to our guest, Amanda, if you will please kick us off. Hi everyone, and thank you, Karen. Um, so uh, first of all, I do wanna thank Revis and the Open Textbook Network for co-hosting today's discussion um, for this super important topic. And um, I'm really excited to see that this has come to the forefront of the open community's crazy hive mind um, because when we all put our heads together to do something, amazing things get done. So that's very exciting. Um, with no time to waste, uh, I wanted to, there were a few things that I wanted to touch on about um, SUNY's experience with print OER. Uh, firstly, SUNY takes print very seriously, seriously enough to bring on someone full time, yours truly, to handle all of that craziness. Um, from the SUNY perspective, print is important um, for many reasons, but let me just give you two real quick. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a seemingly obvious one, but offline access. Um, it is a super important thing. Um, and then a second one with a bit more nuance is um, engagement of reluctant old school, apologies for the air quotes, faculty members. Um, so we have 64 campuses in the SUNY system. We are engaging with most of them in OER. And my job is to work with all of those campuses to coordinate their print efforts if they need me. Um, so a majority of the SUNY campuses are in upstate New York, uh, which is a largely rural area. The concrete jungle, that is downstate. Um, up here, most of the state is all rural, so we have um, inequitable internet service for the most part, and plenty of our students can only access reliable internet on campus. 
So um, offline access is very, very important for these types of students. Um, and the second point that I wanted to touch on about the importance of print from our SUNY perspective is this idea of holding a real book. So, right, so that has many effects. Um, there's that romantic feeling of page flipping to um, that kind of practical need to annotate. We all know how that feels to be able to write in our books. Um, but my primary interest when I came on was in using these real books to ease those hesitant professors, right, those old school OER anxiety that they might have. Um, print opens possibilities, it's inclusive, and it includes those professors who wouldn't even consider OER if it all had to be online. There's a lot, there's a big learning curve with OER and print is a great uh, gateway to all of that. Um, the second thing I wanted to talk about real quick was um, our experience with setting up print on demand. So um, I got on board right when we switched to um, Lightning Source as our printer and distributor. Um, Lightning Source is a subgroup of Ingram. So there was a bunch of learning curves with that and some growing pains. <laughs> um, but it was uh, ultimately we decided on this because it, um, we, are, we value our bookstores with this whole process. And Ingram is obviously a familiar name and it's definitely familiar to bookstores. So um, this is gonna follow their typical ordering process except uh, for a few key differences. One is that it's print on demand and because of that, um, there are no returns uh, that are accepted. So that's kind of an adjustment for a lot of our bookstores. Um, and this is, uh, Lightning Source also allows us to distribute through Amazon. And um, we don't stress the Amazon thing so much because we do want to value our bookstores and we want them to get uh, kind of first dips on those sales. However, uh, Amazon is definitely an important distributor right now um, and provides out of state or even out of country access for our books, which we really value. I just wanted to quickly show you all some examples of what our books look like when they come from Lightning Source. So this is an example of what we would call a master version. This is a whole Lumen course with uh, absolutely no editing. Uh, no cutting down, as you can tell, because it's very large. Um, and then, you know, a smaller example of something that a actual faculty member at Alfred State College uh, wrote. She wrote the whole thing. And we were able to print that for her. Easy peasy. Um, the third thing I wanted to touch on real quick was uh, cost. So we access Lightning Source through SUNY Press. Um, I don't have an insider perspective about the base cost of doing that preliminary business with Lightning Source. Um, we are very fortunate that we have that uh, pathway offered to us through SUNY Press. What I do know and I can tell you about is that they have some charges that you have to deal with when you're working through them, like from my place of uh, placing the uh, uploading content, placing orders and that kind of, well, I don't place orders, but placing orders for things to be printed. Um, so their distribution charge comes in at around $10. Um, and then if you want to make any edits or changes after the book has been published, that's about $40. So there are those kinds of ongoing costs that you have to keep in mind when you're thinking about print on demand. Um, some challenges, there's a lot of challenges, um, but a couple that I'll talk about are um, understanding bookstore operations and a little bit of bookstore culture. That was a big challenge for me. I am not familiar with that and I learned, I've learned a lot in the past year about that. Um, each of our schools are different. We may be the State University of New York, but there are 64 of us and there are 64 different individual campuses. Um, all of those cultures are different and they all require different approaches. So this is much more of a learning curve than it is an ongoing challenge because um, almost all of these bookstores are supportive of OER. All of them appreciate the efforts that we're making to include them. And then there is of course the lightning source learning curve. Let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about here. Um, we discovered that there was a middleman and so pricing was the biggest uh, hurdle we had to jump over for this because we had to make some decisions that were a little over our head at first about how to price these books so that they could be as affordable as possible to students and so that we leave some wiggle room in for bookstores to charge for their profit margin um, and to cover overhead costs and all of that. Um, so, you know, we set this up so that we have almost no publisher compensation, right? Um, so that's the best we could do from our end. And then uh, dealing with wholesale uh, uh, discounts were a bit of a, a, bit of a challenge. Um, 
So another challenge is PDF creation. So how fast a print project can, uh, can go depends on what kind of source file you get from a faculty member, right? So we deal with, like I said, a lot of old school faculty member when we're uh, in the print uh, environment. And so, I mean, I've gotten files in WordPerfect. I can't do anything with that. <laughs> um, but there are plenty of people who still work in those, um, those formats. Right, so um, those are things to keep in mind when you're thinking about de delving into print. Um, for our platform, we use Pressbooks, love Pressbooks. You'll be hearing more about that later. Um, and I have been uh, playing around uh, with my colleague Ed Beck with uh, offline prints in order to um, do some of that PDF creation as we're waiting for Pressbooks to finish their uh, updating sprint. Uh, they've been doing great work to improve their platform even more than it already is and so in the meantime we've been doing some of uh, that kind of experimenting and it's been great fun and uh, i know that i'm running out of time so i just wanted to highlight a fun success is that it's always great to include your students in these kinds of projects and one of the things that we had the most fun with was having a student help us with making a cover now, Allison Brown uh, with SUNY OER Services designed this cover, but a student at Corning Community College did the artwork, and it's absolutely beautiful, and uh, licensed this artwork um, CCBY. So that was a really fun success, and um, we were able to use that and make our uh, content really unique, but also, um, you know, something like Frankenstein, right? We're able to make that unique to us, to Corning, and um, we're also giving that student some uh representation so uh i think um that's all i'm gonna say for now because i do want us to be able to move on so thank you for your time and um i'll talk to you in a minute thank you amanda and now i'll turn things over to liz Great. Um, I'm Liz Mays. And just to give you some context for sort of my experience in print on demand, I am the marketing and sales director for Pressbooks, um, where at one point we had looked into Lightning Source. Uh, I also previously worked at Rebus Community, where I managed print on demand for several of their titles. And I am the co editor or editor of two open textbooks. And further to that, I am a faculty adjunct at Arizona State University, where I teach solely online. Um, so I'm I'm going to preface this by saying this morning on Twitter, I said, I love print and that is true. I can't even remember the last time I read something, a book that was not in print, um, literally years ago. Um, and I prefer print for all kinds of reasons. However, I am going to provide a little bit of counterpoint here. Um, and to the conversation, um, on one of the OERs that I had been co-editor on, I recently had someone say, you know, I'd love to market this to some faculty teaching this course. Can I get some copies of the print version? And I I said, well, wait, please don't market the print version and here's why. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, first of all, the, I don't want students to have to, this is an enormous book, it's like 400 pages, and because of that, paper is expensive, printing is expensive, and it's, I don't really want students to have to buy this book, that was part of the reason we did an open textbook, so they don't have to buy it. Um, and there's also a lot of cool things on the web book of this book, which was done in Pressbooks. On the web book, you can get fun formative quizzes, you can um, basically annotate the book and have a two-way conversation with yourselves in the classroom, with the authors even. And, you know, there's video things that we link to in the book. Uh, the book is a little bit more current than the last print on demand version we did. You know, students can read it on their cell phone. They can download it in other formats if they really do want to, for instance, print off a chapter. They can actually do that themselves. You don't have to make this, you don't have to make them buy the whole book, um, even if they want just a chapter or something. Uh, but most importantly, it's, it's free. Um, so I've had that experience. And then even in my own classroom, I use an OER for one of the classes I teach that's only online. However, that OER was built in Africa. So to get it printed and shipped, it's like $55. And what I ran into at my university is the place where you as a faculty tell students what the textbook is so they can arrive all ready to class and everything. Well, it's managed by our bookstore, which is owned by Follett. And there is no way currently to put a link to a free and open online textbook or a digital version. And if you do that and you try to do that, what they will do is they will either buy copies of the print version or they will only display the print version, which will result in my students buying the print version. So I am probably one of the few professors in America who actually emails my students before the class starts and tells them, please don't buy your textbook. 
Um, and that was proposed to me as the best workaround. Say there's no textbook and tell your students not to actually buy it. And then in my course itself, I have this highlighted and everything. Um, but again, you know, if you know, it is an online class by definition. So students already, we are not in a situation where they can't get online. They absolutely have to get online to take any piece of that particular course. So that's an unusual nuance. Now, going back to the cost of print, I want to say a few things in defense of the cost of print, um, especially for large books. There is a cost to any paper that you want to print. There is a cost to printing. There's a cost to the staff who print things. There's shipping. Um, and I remember when we were doing the research for what would it cost to actually print books, when you actually look at it, um, there's a very low profit. So on a $19, $19.99 book, um, we at, this is actually figures based on Ingram Spark from several years ago, but on, an, on a 1999 book, Ingram would take a 30%, which is the minimum wholesale fee that they would take. Um, there was a print charge of $9, um, which left about $5 um, on top of that. And when you actually count in things like staff time and, and the setup fees and different things that happen, um, or shipping if you're doing like a big batch, basically there was a very low profit, um, less than $5, and only after you had sold 25 books, but before you had sold 50 books. Um, so, so that is one issue. And then there was also the issue of the complexity of choosing a platform. So for instance, uh, Creative Commons books were not necessarily allowed on some print on demand. Uh, platforms like uh, CreateSpace at the time, which is no longer um, available. Um, another complexity was if you as a printer or a publisher of a book are making a decision to use print on demand and you've done Amazon for anything as that entity, you then have to pull all of your stuff from Amazon and wait 12 months if you do want to switch to Ingram. So for us, that was a big D decision, like a something you really have to think about. Um, at the university, I was previously a full-time staff at a university and I tried to get a print on demand version of a book we had created done. And unfortunately, I wanted to do that through Amazon, but they make you enter a bank account and tax information, which you can imagine how many challenges I had trying to get the bank account for the university. <laughs> Um, didn't happen, um, sadly. Um, and then there's also the notion of um, different print-on-demand providers if, for instance, you're pushing through distribution through Ingram um, as opposed to doing it directly on Amazon. There are differences in how the metadata and the authors will show up. There may be limitations to how many authors you can credit, for instance, was one limitation I ran into. And then there's the issue of the lead time for that. Um, for me, I've always run into issues where, um, particularly with the print-on-demand options that like Ingram Spark, for instance, doesn't give you like a website where you can just send faculty and staff to buy the book. Um, you have to have them push it into other channels like Barnes and Noble and Amazon and such. And that can take six to eight weeks. It doesn't always take that long, but sometimes, sometimes it does. Um, I believe one thing we didn't finish researching was Lulu, which they have a really nice website uh, for the book um, and some other benefits. So maybe that would have been an option uh, another questions that we sort of mulled over when we decided on print on demand, you know, again, we did it with the intention of, first of all, validating the authors, bringing legitimacy to that thing, the act of collaborating and volunteering to work on this project. That was really important. We also believe that the faculty, um, I actually had a faculty member uh, when I was talking about the online book, he actually had the print book in his in his bag and he's like look i highlighted it and i've been using it and here's you know here are my great little it was awesome and very validating and i can imagine many scenarios where you might want to be doing you know notes in the margin and different things as as a faculty member as well but if you don't do print on demand then what happens do people start creating print on demand for you at really high prices and for that matter what happens when i issue a second edition are people going if i take the first edition down are people going to start sort of scalping rare copies for ridiculous amounts of money like the whole point of this was to reduce costs for students would students buy the wrong edition could that confusion happen if I leave them both um, so those are all the basic experiences ch problems challenges I've run into that I wanted to talk about today so I'll stop there thanks very much Liz and finally I will turn things over to Jonathan Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, I did also want to point out that in addition to being a full-time uh, senior technologist for Boise State, I also do work with the OTM as faculty presenters. Thanks for having OTM and Rebus. Uh, you know, I come at this from a, a slightly different angle, and I think that's why I was included today. 
And that's uh, from the position as a designer, especially an interaction and experience designer. Uh, the earlier part of my career before I really got serious in higher ed was about visual communication, visual design, and actually for print specifically, uh, the thing is I don't have a lot of the same romantic trappings about print. To me, it's all a practical consideration in terms of engaging audience. Uh, you know, hearkening to, I think, a point that was made by both the other speakers. Some people just want print. And if my goal as a designer is to reach as many people as possible in meaningful ways, that means that even if I'm designing digital experiences, it behooves me to think about print applications of those experiences. And so to just give, you know, a little bit of breakdown on my background in particular, um, I got started with prints and a lot of, um, prosumer products like Adobe's Creative Suite when I was in high school, just being an editor in my, uh, my student newspaper. And then went on to college and I, I was hell-bent on being a, a double major in advertising and graphic design and wanted to do really interesting stuff with typography and prints. And uh, then I caught the teaching bug and became a teacher. And the reason I, I get to this point is my work as a teacher is what attracted me to a conversation I saw on Twitter back last August. Um, as, as an educator, most of the classes I've taught are in composition studies and writing studies, and specifically in technical and professional communication. And since kind of the 90s and what many people refer to as a visual turn, there's been this preoccupation with what is visual rhetoric, what is visual literacy, how, uh, how does writing transcend just the written word, and how do we uh, unpack images and different media. And, and so I had a lot of experience in teaching these concepts to students, the theory of uh, you know, what goes into designing good media, what goes into designing a good competition, uh, composition, layout, font choices, all of the rhetoric that's bound within these decisions. And, and so luck would have it that last August, uh, a, a number of colleagues of mine who I follow in OER, they were having this conversation on Twitter about uh, how nice would it be if there were more people in the OER community who had this experience or had this expertise in not only teaching students the theory of book design about font choice and image choice and placement and so on, but also being able to uh, come in and volunteer skills as a designer. And I said, hey, pump the brakes. I like all of you and uh, whatever you're talking about, I really wanna know more about this, I'd, I'd like to hear. And so uh, what ended up happening is uh, Christina Hendricks, who is the editor of a series, the Introduction Philosophy series that Rebus is producing, and the Perva reached out to me. And over the last few months, I've been working on a project with them it's been sort of advising on you know, some initial choices about um, Pressbooks formatting. You know, Pressbooks does really eliminate a lot of the guesswork in terms of just general layout, and it has a lot of styles already built in uh, to, to adhere to more conventional textbook conventions, conventional conventions. And uh, what they also needed though was, was covers. And for a while, you know, where there, was, there was back and forth about you know, what assets do we have on hand? What style do we like? What, what other textbooks are out there? You know, what do readers expect from a textbook, uh, a textbook image? And I loved it because there was part of me when I was an art major that I would have loved nothing more than designing like album covers and book covers for the rest of my life because it's great. You get to design art that everyone gets to enjoy. Uh, and so, you know, over a series of months, and again, this was volunteer work, and so I know that I wasn't at my most efficient. Uh, we ended up engineering some what, what I think are really striking covers because we're thinking longitudinally across this whole series of books. And so not only you know, will they hold up digitally, but will they hold up across these different topics within philosophy? And furthermore now, what are the print implications of that? And so it's, it's really easy to get excited about creative projects, but they can also be really intimidating. And so the more you can distribute these tasks to specialists, and this has been my experience as well, because we do a lot of work with press books in my office. I've done a lot of work with publishing in higher ed for different types of media, and I've worked with students on this as well. The more you can engage people with really specific skill sets and get them involved in the process, the more efficient the process can become. Because ultimately, you know, and I've, I've seen this even in, in online um, learning development when I work with instructional designers, we all want to be creative, and it's like the golden era for having access to prosumer software. That said, I know I can more efficiently navigate Photoshop and Illustrator and InDesign than a lot of my colleagues who really want to like sit there and play, and I know it's a fun experience, 
But you know, at the end of the day, these projects, they have to be executed and they have to be executed, especially if you're thinking about print, you have to think about pre-flight, you have to think about colors, you have to think about uh, bleeds and cropping and all the printer marks that need to go into producing a book that's going to be reliably what you want it to be because printing's expensive. Um, and as, as Amanda showed off with that large book earlier, I mean, the more pages that you have, the more likely there's going to be errors and you have one shot for what you're paying for. And so uh, it's, it's one of those things that these projects, I think, really benefit from having a little help from your friends. I, I'm chewing my own horn there because I'm, I'm the one who volunteered, but it's been a lot of fun. And I, I think that um, it really behooves us to, to leverage our networks and see who's out there that can help lend their skills. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you to all three of our guests. So there is, as always, an active chat um, and a lot of conversation already happening. I will try to um, surface the questions that may or may not have been answered already, or if you guys would like to explore more, please feel free to unmute, turn on your camera, make yourself known. Um, it can be, you know, a little bumpy with uh, this larger group, but don't let that deter you. Uh, we will um, appreciate hearing from you. So I think the first question we got was from Jonas, who asked, are those charges per title offered for sale via POD platform, not per purchase? And I think this was um, directed at Amanda, I believe. Um, Amanda, when you were giving your introduction, are you able to um, connect Jonas's question with what you were saying? Yes, um, I did want to address that. So um, I, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, those charges, um, yes, they were offered, one, they're a one-time charge for each book. So um, once you finish and put a book through the print-on-demand platform, you have that $10 charge for getting it through. Um, and then that's, you know, for one book, if you wanted to make those changes, it would be um, that $40 that I was talking about for, you know, it, it's a, it's a one-time charge. Does that make sense? John, okay. I see a thanks from Jonas in the chat. So thank you, Amanda. Um, Caitlin and Liz were chatting about Follett, and Caitlin said, my understanding was that you can have Follett say you're using an open textbook on their website, but perhaps they just don't allow links. Liz, do you want to say a little more? Yeah, and again, as I clarified, that was about a year ago. Maybe they've improved this, but at the time, I think the reason for my particular challenge was the notion of an ISBN. So Follett will only allow you to display a book with an ISBN. And in the case of the OER I was using in my in my classroom, um, it the ISBN had only been attached to the print version. Um, so that is the only thing they could display, and the print version was very, very expensive because it was shipping cross continents. Um, the other issue is that there was no way to include a link. There's no way to include a link to a free online version of a book. Um, and by default, you wouldn't necessarily expect that type of version of a book to even have an ISBN. Like you might expect the ebook format to have an ISBN or something, but there was no real way to be like, just upload the book or just upload the link to the book. And so instead of the problem was I would only be showing my students the print expensive edition. I was not allowed by the system to show them the free version alongside it and let them make their own decision. And so Liz, how has it been working? You mentioned that you're one of the few, if not only, uh, instructors telling your students, please don't buy the textbook. Like what has the response been or how does that go over? You know, like people have said they like the unconventionalness of the textbook and they particularly appreciate not having to buy it. I also don't use the entire textbook, so I especially wouldn't want students to buy the whole thing. I use select chapters out of this. I use about four chapters and so the response has been good. Um, Great. I'll also chime in and uh, highlight that Ed Beck shared uh, some of the copy that they use with their bookstore, who are very accommodating, to create two entries to show that there is an OER free digital access from teacher, or you can purchase the printed copy below. So if anyone's interested in, in how to frame that, if you do have that capacity to do so with your bookstore, there's some sample copy there that you can maybe look at. 
And to clarify, I think our bookstore could say that you're using an OER, but not what the OER was. And so that could be kind of problematic. It could point you to your professor, but it was very vague. <laughs> Thanks for chiming in. Um, there's a lot of expertise I know out there, so please do chime in and share your own experiences as well. I'm just uh, trying to capture the questions in the chat, but that doesn't mean we need to go strictly in order here. But that said, uh, third question from the chat, uh, which came from Wilhelmina, she was asking uh, for bank accounts to allow print on demand through Amazon, what are the risks? Just that a purchase made through that account to deduct from the bank account. I think this was, Liz, you were commenting on how difficult it is to get a bank account from an institution. Is that right? Yes, yes. Um, I think the, the issues they had with that were twofold. Um, one was just giving it to some random staff member elsewhere at the university who didn't even work in, you know, the finance department. The second would be the data security of storing that in, you know, some other third party place where it's just accessible. But all Amazon wanted for the only reason they wanted it was to deposit any royalties that might actually come in from the book. Yeah, well, I guess I, I had wondered why not your own, like, because it, I used to sell, like, I used to find in the dumpster at the end of the semester all the textbooks and sell them, and I'd make, like, $8,000 a year because <laughs> of the lease turnover rate, um, and I, I never had really a problem with putting my bank account in, but I guess it's just a personal preference. Yeah, I just, I, I wouldn't have wanted to do that with my personal bank account on behalf of like a university, like I would have felt uncomfortable with that, but I guess depending on your relationship. Yeah, it seems like they would do something where it's just a very limited account, like they would have something like that, just for somewhere on campus just to do weird billing things. Who knows. It's the only place where you get like a purchase order for $20. Yeah, the finance, financial things always seem to get bizarre out. Um, Sybil has a question for Jonathan. Uh, she says, we created one of our OERs in Adobe InDesign. How much accessibility is built into the program and how can we easily share it with others so they can edit it? Yeah, Adobe InDesign is a great example of software that is easy to jump into and difficult to master. Um, it's it's massive because it's designed for all sorts of media production, um, whether it's digital or print. And so there are the resources embedded in there that you can, um, you know, you can in embed um, alt tags and metadata and everything that would be needed for digital publishing in terms of screen readers. But then it really comes down to how are you exporting these digital files? Are you using a, a PDF that's optimized for digital, which has you know, some accessibility considerations. Are you using um, what I recommend, and I think this is part of your question as well, uh, I'd recommend EPUB, exporting to EPUB. That way uh, it can be imported into platforms like Pressbooks and others and rendered more easily. Um, because if, if, yeah, you're looking for other people to adopt your textbook, I think one thing that I know I've hit up against at my own institution when, uh, like we have Pressbooks at Boise State and faculty are wanting to you know, use open textbooks that are published to a PDF, um, finding ways to make that workflow economical and, and quick and intuitive so that they can retain as much of that original design as possible. So they're not having to basically reinvent the textbook with someone else's content. Um, that's, that's the preferred method. And so uh, more native, more native um, exports like EPUB, uh, HTML, and those sorts of things can be helpful. But the trouble is with Adobe, anything Adobe, and I've, I've been Adobe fanboy for a long time, and I'm starting to have second thoughts because um, I have a difficulty uh, affording the subscription model that they've adhered to. And they're a platform that they keep iterating on the fly. It's part of the, the value of the subscription, also the detriment, because if, if I don't log in for two months, it could be that icons have changed, locations have changed, and I have to basically relearn the software every time. And so those are cases where, especially if at your institution, you have students who are working in a, say, a graphic design major, or they have access to these tools. Um, they're really great people to bring in and, and to try and figure out how to support your, your work in, say, Adobe InDesign, because it can be just such a beast to learn. Thanks, Jonathan. 
Another question from Sybil, um, and Sybil, you, you asked if there's any other site for hosting OER beyond Pressbooks and Wikibooks, and I'm, I'm not sure if you mean um, hosting or also publishing and hosting. Um, in the Open Textbook Library, there's a lot of OER that is hosted at an institutional repository. And then Amanda Larson suggested Manifold in the chat, and then the Open Textbook Network is also in um, a new partnership with the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation, which has created Editoria, and we're exploring Editoria um, and the capabilities with them. Um, I'm not sure if there are other sort of favorite tools out there or um, other things people would like to suggest, or Sybil, if you want to clarify if you're thinking primarily about publishing and or hosting or both. Well, to be honest, um, I'm going to have my students do a lot of OEP, so I'm going to host or at least uh, situate my OER pieces. I have a couple of books within uh, Google Docs, which I know some people are going to roll their eyes, but it allows for my students not to have to, um, you know, sign up for anything. They can just go to Google and start playing around with that. They can copy a different, a whole nother, you know, document into their own drive and start playing with it and and then I think from there I will you know download that as a PDF or what have you and put it on whatever site right now I just I kind of want to get started with it all and I'm taking the wiki university or wikiversity class right now the free one about OEP and they're having us play around with press books and to be honest I it reminds me of WordPress and WordPress doesn't like me and <laughs> I've had fights with it. It's, I don't know, it, it's a it, long story. So I was just wondering if there's other sites out there because right now I have this very strange system that I'm using where issue, um, I don't know if you guys know of I S S U U. I have my stuff on there, but now you have to pay for a, a pro account to have people to allow people to download. And it looks really pretty embedded into my LMS because it flips like a book. So I really liked how it's embedded that way. But so now I have students going there, but they can't download from there. So I, I've rerouted them back to the Google Doc folder that's public so that they can download there if they need to. And it's kind of a mess, but yet it, I just don't know. Press books, I'm sure, is, is wonderful. I don't, I'm, a, I'm from a very small college. I don't have a lot of my own money to just have an account with press books by myself, and I don't really know if I'd get any money or support from my administration. I'm sure they would, but I, uh, anyway. So I, I was just curious. I'm, a, I'm sure within, like, what, a couple of years, there'll be a, so many sites out there that we can use and play around with that it'll be amazing, but I, I just thought I would ask this community because I'm sure you've all seen more sites than I have. So that's my story. Thanks, Sybil. Uh, you're not alone. Your story bears many similarities to other stories in terms of perhaps writing collaborative, collaborative, help me out, collaboratively. Collaboratively. Yeah, thank you. Collaborate on the word, Karen. <laughs> Um, in Google Docs and then moving to Pressbooks or another tool kind of when you're getting ready to share it. Um, so Sybil, this is um, I think very common and we're all, many of us still I think searching for a tool where you can do it all, but that may not exist. I, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that it doesn't exist. Um, but Pressbooks, as you've heard, um, is a tool many people like to use. And so I think we're we're all trying to figure this out and find a better workflow for all of the reasons that you mentioned. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in. Okay, next up is Tara's question. Does anyone have a book machine and do their own printing on campus? I think, uh, Tara, you may be referring to an espresso machine, um, which I think are super cool, but I am in the book is printed book is romantic camp as well. Uh, anyone out there? Uh, if I can jump in real quick, and it's something that I meant to mention as well and give a shout out to Amanda on. So in Idaho, um, we also have a, a very rural state, uh, arguably more so than New York. And so the, the digital divide is alive and well, and it's something that we're thinking a lot about um, because we only have a, a handful of higher ed institutions in the state. And so 
Right now, we do not have a press. It's something that we're in conversation about because we have a shared state board of education that oversees all K through 20 in Idaho. And they'd like to see OER become a major component of, a, of especially general education courses. Um, that said, that's where we're partnering with or trying to partner with um, more statewide entities like our, our commission for libraries that sort of governs all uh, public and academic libraries in the state because they seem like a more natural shepherd for that, that sort of centralized effort. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know what other people are doing if they have one. I'm gonna take the quiet out there as perhaps people don't yet have one or um, are looking into it. Okay, uh, next. And I don't know if it's with an Espresso book machine, but I know uh, Ecampus Ontario has recently partnered with one of the uh, institutions in Ontario to do Guelph. their printing. We think Guelph, and we'll follow up on that. Um, and I saw just recently they shared a video of the big books being made as, uh, as they were watching, which is very cool to see. Again, I don't know if it's the same kind of machine, but I think more and more these kinds of models are starting to emerge of, of how to access that, because as, as Amanda and Jonathan have both said, it's, it's incredibly important to have the available as one of the many options for students to access content. If you want to see one in New York, in New York City, which is the place where I've seen an espresso machine, they have one at McNally Jackson Bookstore. Um, and you can print your book on it if you so desire. Um, it's kind of fun to watch. You can see all the mechanics happening. Um, Billy had a question if the speakers would be willing to share the tools they use to design covers. I think we've heard um, people have used the built-in Pressbooks tool. Jonathan talked a little bit about using InDesign. Are there other tools out there that people um, are using to design covers? Canva. I have been playing with Canva lately as well, Matt, but I hadn't thought about it for a book cover. How did it work for you? Uh, it worked great, actually. I was able to do um, a like draft version on my phone in like five minutes. They have like a, a pretty easy template. I wasn't trying to do anything complicated with it. Uh, so they had a free template I could play with. Um, and then I ended up uh, futzing with it a little bit on my computer. But yeah, it worked out great. Great. I see some other people in the chat are also fans. And then uh, some LaTeX cover makers. How hey, did uh, that work, Jonathan? Real quick, I have a question for Matt. Um, yeah. The cover that you're designing in Canva, Matt, was that specifically for a digital cover? Or were you going to print it as well? Uh, so it was mostly designed for uh, digital, although we did use it on the front page of the uh, printed text. The printed text looks serviceable. So yeah. it wasn't something that we were trying to like design. I'm just going to say well. <laughs> so two things to consider out there, and it's something a project I've had going sort of passively on my Twitter feed in the last few months is trying to find open source or low cost uh, single purchase alternatives to some of these creative cloud software. And that like one of the perks of InDesign is that it renders font and other graphical images that aren't say photos in, in um, what they call vector. And so that means that you can resize, you can scale, you can change things around, and it's not gonna become pixelated when you go to print. Uh, and the importance of that is you don't want jaggies on your, your nice printed book. Same thing happens in digital though. Um, the other thing that's nice about a platform like InDesign that I, as far as I know, um, and I could be wrong because I haven't done much with Canva, but when it comes to printing, and you want bleeds, so you want the image running from you know edge to edge across the cover. You want to have a spine, maybe. You want to have a nice printed book. Uh, you need to really be able to change a lot of the orientation and also factor in these these bleeds and crop marks for the printer. Yeah, I would say we've. Sorry, I won't say it, Karen. Oh, I was just saying really excellent points. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Again, to, to print covers specifically, there are, as Jonathan has said, so many more things to consider. Um, how we've approached it, and a program might want to chime in on this as well, is we often have used InDesign to create the front cover and then use the Pressbooks cover generator to make sure all the measurements and everything are correct in order to go forward with it. Um, and and that, that has worked well. Uh, the color profile is really important to consider as well between digital and print. 
Um, and yeah, so right now I think it's kind of a combination of tools that are working for us as we're doing our, our own printing. Um, the, the Pressbooks cover generator is really, really handy because it does automate a lot of that figuring out, you know, if you have X number of pages, you need your spine to be this width kind of thing. There are also, I think, um, I think the various print on demand supplies give you the, the, uh, the formula to work out what you, what you need for yours. Um, and, and Matthew, I see your question there about a workflow of going from InDesign to Pressbooks. Uh, yeah, it's just to export the image out of InDesign and upload it as the background cover image on the uh, Pressbooks cover generator. That's nice and simple. A program? And, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Zoe. I thought you were finished. Uh, yeah, and just a, another question I see there, a Pressbooks resolution requirement um, and a DPI, I believe so, yes. There There's a dimension others. requirement, yep. so the, the pixel sizes are specified, but mm -hmm. DPI is standard for whatever you would use for web, yep. so 790. Yeah. Hopefully there's some Pressbooks documentation somewhere out there that will give a bit more. <laughs> Thanks, Aperva. And then Jonathan and Charity, I think you were chiming in on, on book covers. Did you guys have anything you wanted to add? Okay. Um, let's see. Matt has a related question. If there are resources for faculty authors who do not have OER textbook designers at their school and need to make great press books HTML and make a good looking print edition. So, um, Matt, we've been talking about tools. Maybe you're also thinking about people to turn to, or would you like to say anything more on this question, or if, if we've covered it, or kind of a different angle on it? Uh, I think the chat kind of covered it, but I think the idea was basically like, I have issues with image sizes mostly, and the workflow for that is a little, okay, it's, it's messy. It's basically fixing one thing, breaking three other things, and then trying to fix every other thing. Um, yeah, so I didn't, uh, and I only knew that because I, I talked with a designer. So I was just wondering if anybody had any good ways of doing that stuff on their own without a designer. Designers can be really important and helpful. I think it's, it's a hard thing to, to work around if you don't have that expertise, both in terms of using tools and in terms of that um, design education. I, so I, would also, all, go ahead. I would also say that designers can be uh, notoriously stubborn and and difficult to work with. They are creatives after all, and I know that I'm talking about myself, <laughs> and not not you know, not unironically. Um, that said, you know, so so case in point, you know, this this cover project I've been doing with um, Aperva and Christina, you know, it it's I think there were probably like 15 or 16 different iterations for us to come back around to one of the original designs. And just modify off of that. And I've I've worked with a lot of designers where they'd be done after two or three, and they they would just kind of dig their heels in and say like, "Listen, I'm the designer, and you're not. This is this is what you need to do." And so it's not only just finding a designer, but it's also vetting them and seeing if you can actually work with them. Uh, and and ultimately, designers can be very expensive. I was doing this uh, for free because I enjoyed the creative application while I was trying to wrap up my PhD. Uh, so, so what I would say and what's worked for me in the past is, you know, I've done a lot of other sorts of publications that have gone to print, um, you know, whether they were reports or, or general sort of like publications to um, promote an office at the universities I've worked for. And in those projects, I can't design at all. Like that's not, that's not my full-time job is just producing one of those books and it, it easily could be. And so that's where I would go out to um, communications departments, to graphic communications departments, to art departments, and see uh, what kind of student talent they had available to, to partner with. Um, to me, it was always much more justifiable and for my departments to, to justify uh, giving students some, some stipends or hiring them on student employees to help them participate in the, the process. And then again, the other thing I'd recommend is Put out an open call on social media. This the the open education community is really active and really charitable. 
I just wanted to add one thing to that too. Like when you're working with the designer, one of the things that I think is important, we're making all these open textbooks, is is the design for the cover open and how much more might that cost you to have them license it in that way? Because suddenly then if someone wants to make copies of this book, they're going to have to create their whole new cover if that's not the case. I'd also like to note as someone who worked for many years with designers that it is one of the professions that is uh, aggressively being deprofessionalized and um, it's it's difficult to be a designer because most of us have opinions on visual design and would like to weigh in on the particular shade of green or the particular type um, and so that's why many designers will limit it to three rounds of revisions otherwise you might be going on uh, for a long time so that's probably another topic we could talk about is just how to work with different professionals on the book production process um, I'm mindful that we have a few minutes remaining, and so I think we've covered covers, uh, and I'm going to move on to Jonas's question. Um, he asked, does anyone use MBS as their online bookstore? If yes, have they supported open textbook workflows and or print on demand? Is there anyone out there? I don't know what MBS stands for. Sorry, I don't even know what MBS stands for. But, uh, I'm sure I could find out. I don't know. We don't have a physical bookstore. We just have a an online bookstore. Um, I guess it's MBS Direct, um, and it still doesn't tell me what MBS stands for when I go to their website. But that's the world we live in. The world of unknown acronyms. Um, it looks like Amanda at Penn State has MBS Direct for World Campus. Amanda, do you want to say anything about how that's working or do you have experience with them? Um, I haven't had experience with them with OER or print on demand, but we do have an ebook licensing program that we're using to replace expensive textbooks with um, that is run by my colleague Tori Raish. And they've been really good to her to work on that. So I would imagine that that might also translate into OER print on demand. Okay. Whoa. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the time is up. Yeah, I'm glad you fit in your comment, Amanda. I hope everything's okay there. Fire alarm testing. Okay, great. This is only a test. Um, all right, Jonas, I hope that's um, helpful. There's a, a contact or two out there for you. Uh, Jonathan Poritz had a question. He says, I'm curious about motivation. One speaker said print books were to convince old fuddy-duddy fuddy-duddies to try OER. It was also mentioned the benefit of holding a book in your hand, portabilities, highlighting other things students might like. These both sound reasonable, but do we have any numbers to know if they happen in the real world? For example, he offered his OER through Lulu at about seven bucks and no one bought it. So we, we have been talking a lot about how important print is. Are there people out there? Amanda, I see you unmuting. You can comment on um, the actual popularity of the print version. Um, so I wish that we had more numbers. I think that the data collecting is a really big um, hurdle that we have to jump over with this work right now um, because there are so many other balls up in the air. Um, but I, a lot, of, a lot of, you know, what, our experiences in as anecdotal um, data. Um, and as far as uh, your experience with people, you know, maybe not buying or the popularity not being uh, as, you know, high as you would hope when we talk about all these anecdotal, you know, needs for print. Um, I would just say that, um, A lot of it starts at a conversation with the students and sometimes students aren't sure what they're going to need on the way in um, and continuing to talk to them about what is going to work best for their um, their situation that maybe they're just discovering while they're going through college, um, depending on what their background is, depending on what their um, home life learning environment is. Um, it's important to continue to uh, assess what they might need, um, you know, both in the classroom and something that we should, you know, people um, need to just consistently think about um, so that students don't feel like they're trapped with one method. 
uh, at any point in the semester or any point in their learning experience. Um, but the other thing I do want to say is that it's hard to think about this in um, really in, in terms of profit, right? When we talk about profit, this almost seems like it doesn't, you know, what's the point? Um, but just because I think that the beauty of this movement is that even if there's not a really competitive market demand for these kinds of resources, it doesn't mean that the students who do need it are any less important or that their needs are any less important. Um, and that's, I feel very fortunate that SUNY is in the position where we're able to make that a priority because we already have resources that are allocated to that. And I understand that a lot of other schools um, have much deeper challenges to overcome in order to um, get to that point. But um, we, at this point, are just going to continue offering what we can to whatever population needs it, however many of them there are. I hope that helps a little bit, at least coming from the SUNY perspective. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Great points. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Amanda. And it's something I think for all of us to keep in mind and that a lot of this conversation has been about tools is quite telling. Um, and, and I think we should all be considering more and more ways to make what can be a really big task of, of you know, I mean, it's it's a full-time position for somebody at, at, at SUNY getting the, um, having this working. Uh, and, and we need to be thinking about ways that we can scale that up and down um, as needed. So this does remain as an option for students. It's the, the many pathways uh, idea is that they should always have, have choice. Uh, and, and as you say, Amanda, we're in a position where we can offer that, where we can think about that as the value uh, and not necessarily, you know, how much money we're going to make off the books. Okay, four minutes remaining. I think we can have one more question, um, but I also want to highlight a comment Amy Hoffer, I don't know if she's still on the call, made about using Lulu for print on demand. Um, she's had good luck with them and with no ISBN on the book, you can set the price, uh, excuse me, the revenue to zero, which means students can purchase individual copies at cost plus shipping or bookstores can make a bulk purchase at discount, which gives some room for their overhead. On the downside, she said in the chat, I haven't been able to find out any information about the company. So she's not totally sure who they are, where the books are coming from, why it's so cheap. Um, for example, maybe they have crummy labor practices. So um, I know Amy's been trying to get at their story for a while. So if anyone out there has the scoop on Lulu, um, she'd love to hear it. We'd probably all love to hear it. So as our last question, Charity asked, if anyone has experience using course packet publishers, for, um, for OER, I assume you're, you're thinking um, for the textbook form. Does that, is that anything anyone has tried out there? Uh, yeah, I can unmute. So I've used uh, Xanadu. Um, that is the vendor that my bookstore uh, and my campus uses for course packages. Um, overall, my experience was okay. Um, I think one of the challenges with that is that they, uh, our bookstore wants us to use them uh, because they include the cost of buying back unsold editions into the price that students pay. So um, if, you know, the bookstore orders 15 and they only sell five, Xanadu will buy back the other 10. Uh, but they build that cost into the OER, which inflates the cost. Uh, so um, I, after that, it was about $50 for an OER textbook, which is too expensive for my taste. Uh, so I went with a different print vendor. And uh, I think the challenge is I am not actually allowed to tell students about it because that would be against my university's policies because we can't point people to our, we have to point people to the person who wrote contract. Oh, all right. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, the complexities, right, are always um, more than I think we expect going into any of these um, questions. So we're at the end of our hour, and before we depart, I would um, like to thank our guests, Amanda Wentworth, Elizabeth Mays, and Jonathan Lashley for sharing their experience and expertise. And same to all of you for attending and asking your questions and sharing your experience in the chat. It's always great to, um, 
just get this group together and start uncovering um, the different uh, questions and strategies that people are using to move OER forward on their campuses. Before we go, I will tell you we're taking July off as many of you probably are. We started planning a July session and ran into a lot of uh, calendar trouble. So uh, our next office hours will be in August and we will, um, I think, be able to slip the sign up or details into the chat. Thank you, Aperba. Um, we're gonna be talking about very specific um, adaptations. Uh, we hope to have guests who've adapted open textbooks into another language for an entirely new audience and context and just hear the specifics about their workflows. So that is our plan for August. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks to Rebus Community for uh, co-hosting Office Hours with Open Textbook Network. And thanks, thanks to all of you for working in Open Ed. Absolutely, I'll, I'll add my thanks uh, to all of our guests and everybody else who's contributed today. It's been really wonderful. Uh, we'll see you all in August. Uh, don't forget you can keep up to date with what's going on with both of us uh, on Twitter. So we're at Rebus Community and OTN is at open underscore textbooks and hopefully some links coming in fast for that too. Uh, and also just a brief reminder if anybody's working on projects and is interested in getting out a call for participation and uh, to have some collaborators join you, um, you can uh, send us a, a note through the contributor marketplace and we can get that into our newsletter and Twitter to boost your reach. Uh, if that's a, a point you're at with project, we're really excited to see a few of those going out recently. And yeah, great to, to see more of you getting involved and, and continuing these great conversations that we have every month. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Bye.